YouTube, today I'm going to tell you the story of Lindsay Savannah Rant. But the question I have for you is, did she deserve her punishment? She was sentenced to life in prison for a crime she didn't commit, just for a crime she intended to commit. Her friend, during the process, committed suicide. And the judge said that Lindsay was directly responsible for his suicide. So another question I have is at what point are you responsible for the actions of others? I'll tell you the full story now. So if you do end up liking this video, please subscribe. I know the lighting isn't best, please forgive me. This all started as an online romance and you know, there's many of those, particularly back in 2014. They followed each other on Tumblr, then they became Facebook friends, then they started chatting. James Gamble was 19, aimless and unemployed. Lindsay Savannah Rath was 22 with a newly minted degree from a small liberal art school in Iowa and vague plans to join the Peace Corps. Over the next seven weeks, James and Lindsay felt that them two meeting at this juncture of their lives was part of some grand cosmic plan. They were in similar places in their lives. They were both socially awkward, they were both living with their parents, they were both virgins. They did not spend much time talking about the mundane building blocks of adulthood, school, family and work, in part because those parts of life had felt hostile to both of them for a long time. Instead, they discussed other things like how they both walked in a stiffly manner and too fast. They also discussed how whenever each one of them entered a room, they always felt like they didn't quite fit. And with the two personalities in question, I feel like not feeling a part of something, feeling like where they were was not the place for them is the central theme in this crime. They also discussed how they could tell that strangers were afraid of them. And despite this making them feel alone and lonely, they both managed to flip it around and take this as a sense of power. The power that came from being the kind of person that everyone else wanted to stay away from. Lindsay's parents later said she was subject to merciless bullying from middle school onwards in part of being biracial. Online though, she would manage her image. She put on makeup and took hundreds of pictures of herself edited and filtered to make her eyes look anime huge. Her skin smooth and pale as a doll's. She was obsessed with trying to make herself as beautiful as possible. Now in college, Lindsay started to write a book, a novel, and this novel was about a boy who fell in love with death. And this is probably because for Lindsay, there was never a bright line between what was real and what was make-believe. The vast majority of her social life took place online. Most of her boyfriends were guys halfway across the world whom she never met. After her most recent serious boyfriend, Lindsay tried to kill herself. The hospital bills from this episode stressed her out as well as her student loans. Lindsay, when she was in college, she would just stay in her dorm room writing these fantasy stories about death. For Lindsay, the external world increasingly felt like an irritation. She hated how bland saccharine girls could get boyfriends but she apparently wasn't the relationship type. One afternoon, not long after her breakup, she saw a happy couple hugging in the school cafeteria. Something bubbled up in her. She wanted to punch them. The feeling was sudden and startling like a panic attack and it did not go away. And if we analyze this incident for a second, Lindsay's there in the cafeteria or whichever scenario, she looks externally. She looks at other people. She sees what they have. She assumes this is great for her. She believes that what she doesn't have is what she needs. All of this is going on in her head. It didn't really exist out there. The physical processes are outside, but the way she's interpreting it, is in here. It seems that whenever Lindsay would look at other women or other guys, she would feel inadequate. She would feel insecure. She would break down on the inside, but behind the screen where there's a barrier, where there nobody's looking at her directly. She's not worried about how her hair looks. She's not worried about how she's talking, her eyes, her body language. That's when she could be herself. And that's where finding someone, being in a relationship, became normal to her. This was completely fine, but in person is where she had the difficulty. For the rest of the semester, there were times when Lindsay would see a couple and in her head, she would think, what if I went up to them, 
shot him in the head. Unfortunately, this idea took root. During the fall of 2014, her final semester of college, Lindsay decided that her novel should have a mass murder subplot. Suddenly, she was spending all her time researching school shooters. And this is where her obsession with crime and death took another turn. See, I am obsessed with soccer players, for those that know me. Some of you might be obsessed with actresses, music stars, movie stars, whoever it may be. You follow them on Instagram. They, a lot of them, inspire you in different aspects of your life. For Lindsay, this inspiration was school shooters. She immersed herself in the school shooter serial killer subculture that flourished on Tumblr. It was all just academic at first, she later told an interviewer, but I found myself identifying more and more with the shooters. And there she reveals her motivations. She reveals what was lacking in her life. Attention. She needed someone to come up to her, hold her hand and tell her everything would be okay. But not only that, she needed people to come up to her and engage with her. Hey, how are you? How was your day? And then slowly her personality would come out. I know this because I'm the same. I'm not the kind of person that's going to start a conversation. If someone comes to me, at first I'm a little defensive, but then once I'm comfortable, no problem, I can talk, be myself. I feel Lindsay had a very similar personality trait. The only problem was nobody came up to her. Lindsay and James connected through the Columbine community on Tumblr in late December and quickly began chatting for hours every day. During the first week of their online relationship, Lindsay asked James where he liked to hang out. She knew he lived 2,000 miles away by the Canadian border. She was in the US, but she still found it fun to fantasize about what it would be like if she showed up there one day. Lindsay imagined in her head the two of them both wearing trench coats, exchanging sly conspiratorial glances. People would be like, oh god, there's two of them now. This is something Lindsay would write. What a great way to spend a day, just terrorizing normal inferior people. I hope to do that on a major scale someday. This is what James wrote back. And from these online exchanges, you can gather that they just felt like they were rejected by society. And that's why in their wording, it's not a specific type of people that they have hatred for, it's all people. And this is where the journey in is more important than the journey out. In a situation like this, you have to look at yourself and you have to ask yourself, why is all of this affecting me so much? The problem for Lindsay is James is they didn't have anyone to show them this. They didn't have anyone to talk to them and bring it out of them. An older brother, a sister, a parent, a mentor, whoever it may be. As their conversations continued, Lindsay sounded as if she was just riffing. But James seemed to mean it. He had everything he needed already. He had guns, ammunition, a knife, and a scary outfit. And it seemed that whenever they would talk about school shootings and harming other people, this is when James would be the most talkative in their relationship. Lindsay didn't pick up on this though, and Lindsay would normally talk about Japanese candy and house music and Nordic liquor and stupid family Christmas parties and how cold it was outside. James, however, whenever they would converse, would always talk about mass shootings. He even said to Lindsay one time, I wish I had a partner with me that could take the shotgun while I have a hunting knife and it would be much less chance of me getting caught if I had a partner. James said to Lindsay, I could be your Eric, to which Lindsay replied, how about that? Once they had started talking openly about murder, their conversations now had a new intensity, but also a slight sweetness. Gloomy, human-hating Lindsay could not stop smiling. She told other online friends that she was no longer depressed. She said, It feels like I've been dead for years, and then I suddenly came back to life, and I can actually feel things, and it's like, whoa. James replied to her by saying, It's such a special feeling, isn't it? That there's somebody else out there who feels the same way that you do. Many Columbine experts posit that neither Harris nor Klebold would have taken the lives of their classmates on their own. Rather, there was something fatal in their dynamic. They provided each other with a permission or an instigation. Together they created the shared reality they called NBK and together they inflicted it on the world. And with this dynamic, something similar was happening with Lindsay and James. James said that he had fantasized about committing a mass murder since he was in high school, but it was always a fantasy and something he did not see becoming a reality. 
His depression sank him into inaction. Lindsay was attracted to the aesthetic of spectacular violence, even as she seemed not at all interested in the practicalities of planning such an act. Lindsay didn't have a gun, never had a gun, had no idea how to get a gun, had no idea how to get bullets nor a gun license or anything alike. But in her bedroom, where she would drink vodka, she imagined herself with a gun and what it could do. And if I was to take a quick snapshot into Lindsay's mind, it seems at this point of her relationship with James, the idea of taking the lives of all these people is far more thrilling than actually doing it. It's like a gambling addict. The thrill of victory sometimes is better than victory itself. And I try and picture Lindsay in her room. She's drinking away and she's thinking about all the people that rejected her. She's thinking about all the people who made her feel inadequate and awkward and who destroyed her self-confidence and the fantastical nature of her mind, what she would do to those people, how she would rid their lives, what kind of pain she would inflict onto them, certainly made her feel better in that moment. It made her escape from her reality in that moment. But I don't think in her mind at this point, this was something she ever thought she would do out there. But soon this changed. James asked her that, do you feel that when the moment actually comes, when the time comes and you have all these fantasies, would you actually be able to carry out what your mind is thinking? To which Lindsay said, yes sir. And within six months, Lindsay thought she could have enough money to buy a plane ticket and go to Canada. It was going to be so amazing, they told each other. I'll feel more alive that day than I did my entire fucking life, said James. See, with Lindsay, to her... The Columbine romantic obsession with Klebold and Harris seemed a little ridiculous. She wrote to James, I'm over here like, why be in love with them when I can be them? And over the next few weeks, their plan would come together via their Facebook chat. Lindsay would use her Christmas money and whatever other money she could get to buy a one-way ticket to Halifax in Nova Scotia. But while she was in transit, James would shoot his mother and father. Meanwhile, Lindsay would get a ride from the airport from James's close friend, Randy. Then, sometime that evening, James would shoot Randy as Randy never really wanted to live and then James and Lindsay would lose their virginity. The next day, they would head to the mall where they would open fire on the mindless, unsuspecting Saturday morning shoppers. James said he planned to target middle-aged women, his least favourite demographic fucking wrinkly fat short hair probably believes in god and is just the sweetest person you could ever know i want to see them all bleed this is what james said and i feel like if you look at the description he's probably talking about his mum. lindsay said that she would target basic bitches and people who looked genetically inferior their massacre would be optimized for virality james would be holding a camera he'd get a victim to hold the camera and then they'd be filming everything that's going on and if there were a whole bunch of people nearby who had their phones out filming the whole thing their lives would be spared as that's another video being uploaded giving them more virality in fact james he actually offered to die second so he could upload a video of lindsay's suicide before he finished himself off now on her last day in her parents house lindsay packed a small suitcase to take to canada this contained a change of clothes the skeleton mask she planned to wear during the shooting her makeup her laptop a couple of comics and thus spoke zarathustra by friedrich nietzsche her favorite book now i could be wrong but thus spoke the book by nietzsche is the one where he said God is dead. And this further indicates the identity crisis she was going through. She didn't have a place, she didn't have a purpose, she couldn't make sense of what her reality was. Nothing wrong with reading that book, I'd all recommend you reading that book. But if you follow her action so far, and the fact that she is reading that book, she's obviously confused. She painted her nails to pass the time, and she also worked on a manifesto. It talked about battles and hate and strength, about being beyond good and evil about how being free from empathy means that the isolated man sees the world for what it truly is. See, from that, I could infer that Lindsay had a sense of entitlement. Well, I deserve to be happy. I should be happy. I should have all these friends that I crave. I should have all this attention I craved. 
To which I say, none of that matters. You didn't ask for any of this. You didn't choose to be born. You didn't choose your parents. You didn't choose your house. You didn't choose your gender. You didn't even choose your own name. So in reality, are you even free? I mean, yes, of course we are free. But given the fact that we live in a reality that none of us asked for, we're not really entitled to anything. And this manifesto, Lindsay scheduled it to go up on Tumblr after the attacks when she presumed she would be dead and millions of people would be searching for answers. However, sometime earlier that day, the Halifax Police Crime Stoppers tip line received information about a local teenager, his online girlfriend and their Valentine's Day plans. And a quick internet search for the police they saw James wearing fatigues and had weapons next to him, which was enough confirmation from the tip to justify an arrest. That afternoon, plainclothes officers placed James' parents' house under surveillance. At 8.59pm, a Halifax police officer called James' mobile phone. During their five-minute conversation, James was cooperative and unemotional, the officer later said. He told James that the officers had seen his social media posts and wanted him to come in for questioning. Officers were actually outside his house in unmarked cars and there didn't need to be any fuss. James agreed to go with them and he said I'll be out in a minute but after a while the police noticed that his front door did not open. Moments later the police officers heard the sharp blast of a hunting rifle. James had shot himself. Lindsay's flight landed in Halifax just before midnight although the border agents had been alerted to look out for her. Lindsay somehow passed through the first custom screening, but the next agent she spoke to thought she seemed strange. This immigration officer said later to police that Lindsay had bad teeth, she had bad skin and just a weird vibe, as well as the fact that she had a one-way ticket, very little cash and a very small suitcase. The immigration officer wondered if she was on drugs or was transporting drugs. She told the agent she was in town to spend a memorable Valentine's weekend with her boyfriend, but that she did not know what his address was. Officials soon connected her to the Crime Stoppers tip and arrested her. Randy, who was outside waiting for her in departures, he was also arrested. At first, Lindsay didn't seem too worried. A day after her arrest, she bragged to a fellow prisoner about her failed plan. I had a skull mask and he had a scream mask and our plan would have been perfect, she said. What Lindsay didn't realize was that this prisoner was an undercover officer and this conversation was added to the transcripts when it came to court and evidence against her. In November 2016, Randy, who was James' friend, who helped keep the massacre plan a secret, was sentenced to 10 years in prison for conspiracy to commit murder. Six months later, when it became clear that Lindsay's chat logs with James would be permissible in court, she changed her plea from not guilty to guilty. That meant that she would forego her right to trial and that the judge could sentence her from anywhere between 10 years to life in prison. When the judge gave his sentence, he spoke about Lindsay, James and Randy, how they were each socially isolated and despondent and how they each had come to be fixated on Columbine. The judge went on to say, as with dripping water on a stone, the repeated internet messages and imagery justifying and glorifying extreme violence left an indelible mark on each of them. The judge then looked at Lindsay and said that she bore some responsibility for the suicide of James and then sentenced her to life in prison. A Canadian firearms expert publicly claimed that the massacre she had helped mastermind was virtually impossible given her and James' weaponry and a lack of experience. But then again, it wouldn't be accurate to say that she did nothing. Online, Lindsay wasn't just a Columbiner, she was also a self-proclaimed Nazi. And this is what I said in the beginning, even though she didn't commit this crime in the end, she had every intention in doing so. In fact, this wasn't like she had a sudden change of consciousness. Oh, James, I don't want to do this anymore. This was simply because of a random tip that was given to the police. They did everything to stop it. She did everything she could to make it happen. So what should her punishment be then? I don't know. I'm not a judge. I don't know Canadian law. But from a moral point of view, life in prison seems kind of harsh. But at the same time, if you are a phone call, a phone call away. That's what this tip was. Let's assume. Let's assume this tip the police got was a phone call. Lindsay 
was one phone call away from taking the lives of potentially 20, 30, 40, 50 people. The thin line between life and death. So maybe a life sentence would be harsh, but 50, 60 years, maybe that's appropriate. I don't necessarily know. And just to finish on this, I don't think Lindsay actually believed in the Nazi manifesto or whatever you want to call it. I just felt like this was something that channeled her anger and the online Nazi group or I don't know, group chat or whatever it was, was one of the few places where she felt accepted. So she just thought, fuck it, I'll run with it. Anyway, why don't you guys comment, tell me what you think.